Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Incredible job. Um, I also want to thank my friend Decades. Um, it's so nice to see someone who remembers you when, and um, very meaningful to be loved by you. Um, and then, of course, I want to thank my wife who came with me, and if everyone could just look at her, please, because she loves to be the center of attention. I'm just kidding. She actually hates it. Um, she's the yin to my yang, and um, to, to love and be loved is such an adventure with you, and thank you for coming with me to this. Um, you know, I... The concept of expectations has always hit me to the core because I'm a planner and I like to think about how things are going to work out with all the different alternatives. And I came into the program and learned that that was part of my crazy. And uh, recently I heard this concept of not expectations but expectancy. To have an attitude of expectancy is different than having expectations. It says I'm going to show up and I'm going to believe that this is where I'm supposed to be, that God wanted me here, that God wanted you here, and whatever is going to happen is going to be good. And so I'm learning to live in this, I, I have an attitude of expectancy rather than expectations for exactly how it's supposed to turn out. Um, and then the other thing I always think about right before I talk is, you know, if you can't be a good example, be a loud warning. So <laughs> that, that may be what you get today. So, um, so I, I am committed to being honest and sharing my experience, strength, and hope. Um, and I'm just so glad to be here. I did grow up in alcoholism, and most everyone in my family will call alcoholism by its name today, but for a lot of years, we didn't know what was wrong. We just knew that something was wrong, and if you asked me, I would say it was very, very wrong. Um, I am the oldest of five, and my father is a drinker, and my mom is a crier, and I am a screamer. Um, I thought that being the oldest meant I was to fill in the gaps of my parents, and there were a lot of gaps. And so I have always been someone to quickly assess a situation, identify the needs, and then fill that need. And I am highly critical, very self-righteous. I think I was born arrogant, smug, dom and dom self-righteous and domineering. That's, I think, my personality. Um, I remember being five years old in kindergarten and looking my mother up and down and thinking I could do a better job than you. And um, that is a vivid thought um, that I remember. And both my parents did not have my respect. Uh, they were failing miserably. And um, my dad could, he also suffered from depression and he could not keep down a job and we were constantly moving. Um, I also should share with you that my dad is a pastor. And so I am a typical PK um, in that you can't tell me anything. I already know it all. Um, and I uh, had this fury, this anger inside me all the time because my father was fooling everyone, and you are all damn fools. And he was very charismatic, and um, obviously I'm speaking today, it's like I clearly got some of that from my father, and I'm okay with that. But, um, you know, he could move the whole room. And I just remember feeling like I was the only one who knew the truth. And, you know, they talk about being as sick as your secrets. And I'm telling you, if you ask my family, they were begging me to keep a secret because I wanted to tell everyone that this is not the way it's supposed to be, that it is wrong. My mother used to say, you see everything black and you blow it up to make it worse than it actually is. My brothers and sisters, because I taught my youngest how to dial 911, the police were at our house all the time. Um, I was begging them to take us away. My father was not violent with us, although I was in his face like he could have been. Um, there were definitely things broken in the house and holes in the wall. Um, and I think back to how I was, and I mean, it's, it is 
Like it wasn't until I got into Alateen that I learned it's super dangerous to be in the face of somebody who's drinking. But I don't know where I had this weird courage that I just was in his face all the time. And uh, I wanted something to change. I just felt like this, you know, if, I, if only I was born in a different family, like I would have a shot at life. And I just felt this like chip on my shoulder, just like everything is wrong. And, um, you know, we would go to church and put on the facade. And, um, and to this day, I can look my best when I'm at my worst. It is a knack I learned growing up in that house. It is so important for me to have a home group and a circle of support of people who know what I'm not saying and people who can spot that in me. Otherwise, I could be one of those people. You know, a, a lot of times in AA, they'll say, let's say a prayer for the people that are still suffering. It, it's not just outside these rooms, but there are people suffering inside these rooms. And that totally could be me. Like, I'm the type of Al-Anon that would die of alcoholism because I don't want you to know I'm hurting inside or I'm broken or I'm falling apart. So it is such an act of defiance for me to be in recovery. It goes against everything in me to be here and to be honest with you um, because everything is saying, look good, don't feel good. Look good, don't feel good. Um, but anyways, here I am. You know, this is, this is what we, we are charged to, to do. Um, so anyways, growing up in that home, um, People would kind of pat me on the head, blonde hair, blue eyes, super petite. Oh, isn't she so cute? She's so-and-so's daughter. And I just remember, like, as a little girl wanting to be like, I don't want to blow you out, but <sighs> like, I just felt this ugly blackness inside of me, just this rage. And my rage was like my energy. It was like how I functioned. And I was so determined, just vigilant to, like, beat this thing and get out. Um, by the time I got to Alateen, I was 15, um, and my mother sat us all down on the couch, and she's like, your father's an alcoholic. And honestly, it was like one more name to call him. I didn't know what it meant to be an alcoholic. I just was like, whatever. And, you know, you don't have to drink to suffer from alcoholism. Every single person in my family was suffering on some level. Of course, I thought I suffered the most, but um, we were all trashed. And uh, by the time I was 15, I was jaded, I was bitter, I was, you know, self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is actually my drug of choice. Um, I, can, I can do it myself, thank you very much. And um, so I went to my first Alateen meeting. Um, I know exactly what I was wearing. Why, you ask? Because I kept a log. And I literally wrote it all down. There were um, there were periods where my dad lost everything and we were homeless, which was humiliating. Um, and uh, I remember, like, when we lived in this one campground and every week we just moved, you know, because they only let you stay in a spot for a week at a time to keep the homeless out, but we fooled them. And um, this one time we were in this place, and I just remember my dad would leave in the morning, he'd go try to find work or food, and my job was to keep the kids entertained because my mom was so, so broken. And um, I remember spotting a family who was actually vacationing, and they were right across, and they, like, had this tablecloth and the food and the kids and everything. And we were like dingy, hungry, just staring at them, right? And probably not just because we were hungry for the food, but because we were hungry for the family. And um, I remember the mother locked eyes with me and realized like what we were. And she like picked up the tablecloth and scooted her kids into the tent. Like, like, like let's just not deal with this. And I'm telling you, I stood a little taller. I stared her down, like, don't you pity me? And I was 10, you know? <laughs> but I was like, bring it, you know? Like, I just, the self-righteousness was my, it was just my armor. And I just have always had this, like, no, don't you look down on me. And so I kept a log of everything I wore. No one was going to know I was poor. I always look good on the outside. I know exactly what I wore to that Alateen meeting. And plus, I was all pastels because it was like, you look more pure. And um, <laughs> it, was, it, it was April 30th, 1987. So in the oh, wow. 80s, like the pastels were really in. And um, I, I have 
I, I just also have to share with you, I am a good girl. Like, I'm so good. Like, I'm the goodest of good. Um, and I, you know, I get straight A's. The teachers love me. I always sit in the front row anywhere I go. Um, I'm a rule follower by nature. My sponsor used to say, you know, Sarah, you might be right, but it's the way that you're right that is so wrong. <laughs> So I get my identity in it. So I come into the Valentine meeting, and, you know, the, the first thing that happens is a guy leans back in his chair, like, dangerously low. He's missing his front tooth. He has a mohawk. He's, like, big black leather jacket. And he asks me, like, if I, I want the smoking or the non-smoking side of the room, which is, like, do you want the peeing side of the pool or the non-peeing side of the pool? And I, like, come in, and I'm like, oh. He looked as bad as I felt inside. And I honestly, it was like a spaceship landed and all my people got off. They were all talking about what was happening in their home with such candor and honesty and like details. Every, like, I was like, where have these people been? Like I needed and craved that raw Alateen honesty. If you've never been to an Alateen meeting, I encourage you to go because they say it like it is. And I just needed that unfiltered, you know, I'm the this good Christian girl, and like I just was like, ah, what is this place? And I'm telling you, from day one, I knew I was going to be here for life. I just knew, and I, I, I actually feel sorry for people that are like, do I belong? Do I not belong? I'm like, I don't know, but like I have always known this is like what I've always wanted, and you know the the, the cravings that I have inside for structure and for family have been satisfied in Al-Anon. And I, I will read our literature, and I'll read about Lois Wilson and some of the, <clears throat> the old timers who started this thing, and it's like, it's like Ancestry.com. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like learning about my lineage, and I, I just, I have this connection to everyone, and I feel like when we come here, it's like a family reunion, and I'm meeting cousins I didn't even know existed, and I don't know why I fit so well here, but I'm so grateful. Anyways, just because you fit doesn't mean you get better, right? <laughs> there is still a program to be worked, and there's a difference between being around the program and being in the program. Yeah. And when I first came in, I, I mean, I was 14, 15 years old. I, I just believed with everything that I had that the alcoholic was the problem. And within a couple of months, um, a bunch of things that happened which I won't go into, but essentially I left home when I was 15. And I will tell you, I was not the bad kid. I was the good kid. I was class president. I had a 4.0. I was a virgin. I didn't smoke or drink yet. Well, actually, I never drank, but I didn't. I did start smoking. Um, but I was the good kid, and I left because things were just that bad. Um, and when I left, it was to prove a point. Everything, I love the speaker last night who talked about being retaliatory. Everything about me is to get even with you, to show, I'll show you. Um, and so when I left home, it was to show my dad how weak he was and like, this is what it looks like. And me against the world seemed like a fair fight. It really did. I was that arrogant. Um, so I left home. I moved in with a friend. I went to a private Christian school on scholarship and I cleaned the boys and girls restrooms in order to be at that school. Um, within a couple of months, my friend kicked me out. Um, because I stole her boyfriend, which was not my fault. Um, in fact, after I got into the program and worked the steps, I, I realized that I never really picked any boyfriend. They always picked me, and I just went along. And um, so it was never really my fault. But anyway, so I, um, I ended up moving in with a Cuban family who had a room for a foreign exchange student that didn't come that year, and it was a god shot. And I rented that room, and I learned there that love is not a cure for alcoholism because that family loved me so well. But I had already been, just like love can't get an alcoholic sober, love cannot cure the effects of alcoholism. And I don't know why that is. I do know that God is bigger, but that family loved me so well, and I could not take it in. In fact, they used to count how many times I'd eat dinner with them because it was too much. Because after I left home, my mom and dad split up, lost everything. My mom took the two babies and went into a home. My sister went into one home and my brother went to another. My dad moved out of state. And they were homeless for two and a half years, living in shelters. 
uh, mm -hmm. in people's backyards, hotels, motels. And, um, you know, even if I wanted to go back home, there was no home to go back to. And I felt so much guilt, this survivor guilt, because I left first and then everything fell apart. And it wasn't until I worked the steps that I found out what was mine and what was not mine. I had it all backwards. I took responsibility for things that were not mine, and I wasn't taking responsibility for things I did have control over because I was so focused on the wrong things. But I really felt responsible for my family, and I felt so much guilt that I couldn't save my siblings. Um, anyway, I lived with this family, and they were such a lovely family that I couldn't take in their love. I felt guilty for it, and uh, I got a job. I worked my way through high school. Um, after you know high school, I was voted most likely to succeed in everything, and I ended up pregnant. And I will tell you, the reason why I was pregnant instead of going to college was because there was a hole inside of me that I hear alcoholics talk about. And when I left home, if I had been an alcoholic, I would have started drinking then because I know that incomprehensible demoralization and the loneliness that I hear alcoholics talk about. I know so much, but I remember just stuffing it way down because I'm on my own. I have to be strong. And I, I would think about my resentments and my anger and take it like vitamins, you know, and I just keep going, keep going. I know the difference between a battery and being plugged into the wall. For me, self-sufficiency is like a battery. It always goes dead. But if I'm plugged into the actual source, it will run through me and I don't get tired. I don't get angry. I don't get frustrated. For me, when I get tired, that's usually a sign that I'm on self-sufficiency again. But during that time, I needed something to take the edge off right? I, I am just a bottle of nerves. I'm going to Alateen one meeting a week. It's like the one place that I felt like I could be my age. Everywhere else, I felt too old. I felt too responsible. I was so serious. I was so determined to make something of my life, to prove my dad wrong, to be the first woman president. Like I was so <laughs> ambitious and I just would go and then I'd be at home and I'd just fall apart. And I couldn't let anyone see that I was just dying on the inside. Um, Anyways, for me, I, I found like a drug of choice. I found something to take the edge off, and that was attention. And it was attention from somebody who needed me. To this day, if I hear I need you, it's like so much more romantic than I love you. Like, there's, it, like it activates me. I, it just does. Like, I just light up inside. Like, I, I was like born to fill your needs. And, um, you know, and I would hook up with these guys that were so, so broken. And also, they make me look better. You know, because if I'm standing next to them, I shine. And I'm all about looking good. And and so I began to have like boyfriend after boyfriend and that's really how I coped. I remember realizing, oh my gosh, I can't be alone. Like I knew I had this very stark self revelation that I could not be by myself. So I began to overlap all my relationships. If one was going down, I would start another. And I know some people call it cheating, but I call it overlapping. <laughs> because it's just more efficient and I love efficiency so it, it's smooth and um, so anyway what happened was because I was overlapping I ended up pregnant and I didn't know who the father was and for a good girl like me that was real bad I couldn't blame my dad I couldn't blame my mom I couldn't believe blame this nice family I live with. I couldn't even blame the dad because there's two. You know, so I was like looking in the mirror going, like, oh my gosh, I'm now making decisions that are ruining my life. I can't keep blaming the alcoholic. And I was going to Alateen. I remember uh, the guys in the Alateen group joked about getting shirts that said, not the father. Because that's how Alateen support each other, right? And, uh, you know, together we can make it. And I remember my, my best Alateen girlfriend was like, you know, I, I was like, I'm just going to move across the United States and, like, give the baby up for adoption, and then I'll come back. And she's like, wait, that's what your dad did. Like, that's called the geographic. You're not allowed to leave town. We don't care if you give the baby up for adoption. We don't care about the baby. We care about you. So you're going to just keep coming, keep sharing. And I, and that's what I did. Um, at eight months pregnant, I was in a Bob's Big Boy uniform smelling of bacon, and I had, like, this, uh, this like, bottom where I was like, oh my gosh. First of all, I felt tired. I was 19 years old, but I felt so 
flip in, exhausted. Like I felt like a frail 90 year old woman that if you went, I'd fall over. I felt so emotionally exhausted. And I remember having the thought that if I put the baby up for adoption, I'm gonna go right back to how I've been living. And I just, I can't figure it out. I just can't live like this anymore. I'm exhausted. And so I just said this prayer like, God help me, that's it. Um, and I, you know, adoption is a very beautiful thing. And I know lots of people, um, but I was supposed to have this girl. I really do believe that. And uh, part of part of having her and keeping her is what helped me really embrace the program. It helped me transition. So I ended up having this baby. She's now 30 years old. So she survived me. Um, but I had this child. And I was so like, okay, I've got to do something different. I knew the answers were in the program, and I even knew they were in the steps. Like, I'd get a sponsor. I'd work steps one, two, three, get a new sponsor. Because every time you get a new sponsor, they're like, oh, would you mind going back to step one? Oh, no, I understand. Yes, let's do it. Because I was so afraid of the fourth step. And I now know it's because I was brimming with responsibility. I was like up to here. I couldn't take one more thing to work on. And, um, you know, the fourth step really did set me free. I love the example. Like it's just about turning on the light. You need to clean the room, just turn on the light. So you know where things are, what needs to be picked up, what needs to be added. And it, it's like disarming, you know, but I had really built up the fourth step and I was so scared. You know, when I was growing up, my dad used to say, you have the spirit of Jezebel in you. And I was so afraid that maybe she's in there. And I'm still a little afraid of that. But anyway, um, like, what if it is all my fault, right? What if it is? And what if, what if, you know, like, it was too much. Today, I know there's freedom in saying, like, I am responsible for my happiness. You know, we talk about, you know, you can be happy, serene, stable, Stability is my big thing. Um, whether the alcoholic is drinking or not, you can also be miserable whether the alcoholic is drinking or not. That's up to me. Like, it's on me. But anyway, the fourth step freed me, but I just kept doing that dance. One, two, three, get a new sponsor. One, two, three, get a new sponsor. And after having my baby, it was like, no, no, I need to change. I could not, I could not keep blaming up the alcoholic or anyone else. So um, I fell into a very structured Al-Anon group. They now call it high pressure group and we have <laughs> literature about it. But I will tell you at the time I needed that group. I needed someone to tell me exactly what to do because just as much as there's somebody who likes to be controlling and we all know them. If you don't know when someone control, if you don't know someone controlling an Al-Anon, it's you. But for as many people as there are wanting to control, there's people that come in here wanting to be controlled. You know, like I can't, I just tell me what to do. And that's where I was at. I was, you know, they say a bottom will get you either a breakdown or a breakthrough. And I think for me, it was a little bit of each. Just so you know, you don't have to get pregnant to hit a bottom. But um, for me, that was, that was the thing. So I joined this group and uh, made a commitment to work the steps. And I did. I worked all 12 steps in order. Then I went on to the traditions. I started getting commitments. I had a jacket with my name on it. Yeah. I became like Miss Alanon. And I was so like, I am going to raise my kid free of alcoholism. Like I have that much power. Um, and I met a man in AA who was just as fervent about Alcoholics Anonymous as I was about Alanon. In fact, when he asked me for my phone number, he put it in his big book. That means something. So you know. And uh, I later heard destined or doomed. But um, but we, you know, began to trudge the road of happy destiny. And we, when we got married, my daughter was two. And, uh, you know, the thing about that is I got a sober husband, but my daughter got a sober daddy. And for years, I didn't realize that I thought, that's what I wanted. I wanted the sober daddy. So for me, giving that to my daughter was like, the greatest thing. And again, I thought it would ensure us from being affected by alcoholism. I worked a program believing that it was like putting insurance 
into like the disease of alcoholism. And I'm sorry to share with you, it doesn't work that way. Um, anyway, each time there's a sober period, we think the problem has gone away. That's in our literature. Um, my sober, I now call him my husband. Um, he had just shy of nine years sober and he went out. And I remember when I smelled the alcohol in our bed and I dismissed it like it was the dog. And my golden retriever does not drink or have a drinking problem. But, you know, here's this man who professes to be an alcoholic every day, but it can't be him. Today I understand denial is so, so great. I did not want to believe that the man I married, in fact, I think it was in our vows, like you cannot ever drink again. Uh, okay, I do. You know, um, like that was part of the deal. We were in this AA Al Anon group, like, that was not supposed to happen. It was like somebody threw a grenade and my whole life blew up. And I remember uh, at that time, our group was just crazy. And um, I remember my daughter saying, Mom, they're talking about Dad like he's a monster. And he's not a monster. He's my daddy. And I love him no matter what. And I got down on her level. She was seven. And I was like, honey, you're right. You know, your dad will always be your dad, and he loves you. And she was like, well, Mommy, why can't I see him? And I screamed at her, because he's drinking. And in that moment, I realized I might as well have called him a monster, right? And we have literature, and, you know, uh, the dilemma of the alcoholic marriage, and, like, we talk about it's okay to love an alcoholic. But in that moment, I was like, is it okay to love an alcoholic? Or is it only okay to love a sober alcoholic? And I realized there was something in me who, who hadn't really taken in this whole idea that alcoholism is a family disease. Um, things got really ugly really fast. He didn't just go out and have a beer. Like, he was committing felonies. He was slamming speed. We lost everything. And during that time, I, was, I, I got a new sponsor. I was going to meetings as if my life depended on it. I was crazed. And I'm not super proud of it. Looking back, I realized I never really worked step one because I was thinking as long as I work a good enough program, I have power over alcoholism when that's not even the case. Like bad things happen to good people. And just because I'm feeling bad, that doesn't mean I'm in a bad place. And just because I'm feeling good doesn't mean I'm in a good place. Like my feelings cannot be a measure of how I'm doing. And sometimes recovery hurts. Sometimes growing pains sting, and sometimes the suffering is important and necessary to get us to the next place. And it, you know, Al Anon has given me tools to deal with the pain, to deal with the struggle, and not to like never have it again. But I thought success in the program meant I was not going to have any more problems again. And that's just not true. And so when I see someone who's struggling, that doesn't mean they don't have a good program. It's quite the opposite, right? So anyway, my thinking was like, ah. And uh, I remember my, my new sponsor told me, you know, Sarah, it's not so much important that you do what I think you should do as that you just keep sharing with me what you're doing. Just stay connected. And that was powerful because I had come from a place where I put a sponsor on my pedestal. My sponsor had been my higher power. How high is your higher power? And um, I had this new sponsor who was helping, who was directing me to a higher power, who was a channel, who was listening, asking questions, encouraging me, encouraging me in the program, not telling me to get a divorce, not telling me to get a restraining order. I remember saying to her, gosh, you know, should I show up to court? And she's like, I don't know. Like, that's not a decision your sponsor should be making for you. Um, I did actually show up to court one day. I dropped my my ex-husband off at jail once because um, he was going to turn himself in, and I was so proud of him. And then I came into the World Service Assembly, and I remember my friend said to me, I wonder how many other al here dropped their husbands off at jail today. And I was just like, oh my gosh. But, you know, I learned you keep your commitments, right? We serve when we're suffering. We get out of ourselves when we want to retreat and, and be hidden. You know, when, when everything's fall, this is the best place to be when you're in the worst place, right? This is the best place to be. So I kept my commitments. I kept showing up. And uh, my sponsor was like, just keep sharing, just keep sharing. Um, anyway, I want shortcuts. I always want a shortcut. And I saw this book and it was 
potatoes, not Prozac. And so I read the back because I'm super smart. I don't know if I told you that. I'm really smart. I'm book smart is what it is. Like I test well. That's that's about it. But uh, I read the back of the book. I got the gist of it. I go home to my daughter. I'm like, we're going to eat these potatoes. And you eat, you bake potatoes. You have one every night with nothing on it. An hour before bed, it increases serotonin. And I'm like, mommy's not going to cry anymore. We're going to eat these potatoes. I'm in recovery. And so we're eating these potatoes every night. And this, uh, my daughter stopped after a few nights. But listen, uh, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Like, I love those kind of structured programs. You know, um, I have my things to do list and then I have my things that have been done list and my things. Yeah, anyway, lots of lists. Um, I'm eating the potatoes. So this one night, I'm on the way to the meeting. I'm late. I'm in traffic. I'm smoking. I'm crying. I'm And I, you know, look over at my daughter, and she has like a tear coming down her face, and she goes, Mama, I did not think the potatoes are working. <laughs> and I share that story not because it's a it doesn't make me look good, that story, right? But um, I actually talked to my daughter this morning, and she always asks if you're going to tell the potato story. That's her favorite story. Um, you know, because uh, there, we used to have in our literature, you know, the alcoholic gets so sick, and we get sick too. And that had nothing to do with my ex-husband's drinking, or even my dad for that matter. Like, that was all me. And uh, I, I did show up at that meeting, and just like everything else, when you're going through something, the fastest way through is through. And um, there, re I mean, if there is a shortcut, it's service, right? That's pretty much the only thing is to be a service because your character defects get like brought to the surface and then you deal with them. But honestly, there's just no shortcuts. And alcoholism, you know, has no respect for time. It didn't. Alcoholism didn't care that I've been going to meetings for ten years. Like that just meant nothing. Um, so I, I got to work the steps again. I got to really get deep. I ended up um, getting a divorce. I did not want to get a divorce. Um, but when my husband came out of, he was locked up for a while. When he came out, he was like, you know, I lost a lot when I went out because he got sober again. Um, and part of what I lost is my love for you. What? I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, I have been through so much with you, and you're leaving me? I mean, again, incomp incomprehensible demoralization. Like, I could not believe it, and I was devastated. People I remember at that time who were, like, going through divorce or separated were, like, bouncing back into new relationships, and I, I was, like, like, having this, like, visceral reaction. Like, I could not even fathom it. And I remember being in a meeting just falling apart and feeling like a failure because my marriage didn't make it. And, you know, someone once said, you know, not all marriages make it. And even in recovery, like, recovery doesn't guarantee that. You know, that's not one of the promises. Um, but uh, somebody suggested going to school. And, you know... It's, it is, for me, part of the second step, getting restored to sanity. I believe that alcoholism ripped me from the track I was supposed to be on. I believe I have a creator. I believe I was made by design. And there is a purpose and a plan for my life. And alcoholism was like, <clears throat> took me off that track. And working the steps has literally put me back on track. And, you know, there's a saying, you can't have a dream come true if you don't have a dream. And there's some things that get restored. Not all, but some things get restored. I was supposed to go to college. I know that in my bones. I was supposed to go to college. I, was, I had been on my own since I was 15. I had straight A's. I'm book smart. I was determined and ambitious. And for whatever reason, I got skewed off that path. And so when I went through my first divorce... Um, here's a teaser. I did marry him again and divorce him again. Just so you know, we'll get there. But the point is, my first time divorcing him, I ended up going back to school. And it took me forever, but I got my degree. And that is maybe not conference approved to share that with you. But let me just say that I knew I was supposed to go to college. And so when somebody said it, it clicked. 
that's not what I'm, I'm not supposed to get in a rebound relationship. I'm supposed to go get my degree. And that's what he did. And being a single mom and going to school, you know, I still love the martyr thing because I get energy <laughs> from it. So when people are like, wow, you're a single mom, you go to school. And it was like, yes, more, <laughs> you know, um, but you only get so far on that martyr energy, right? It's the same as anger, right? It's the same as anger. It only gets me so far. Um, but anyway, at that time, my ex-husband was like back in AA and everybody thought he was great. He was assistant coach for my daughter's soccer team and they got him a shirt with his name on it. Everybody thinks he's so great. And I remember just raging in the car, crying at my sponsor. Like everybody thinks like, what is it about alcoholics? You know, just like my dad, they fool everyone. When I'm the one that should be getting the accolades, I'm the one who should be shining and they think he's so great. And um, I was like, what is it about alcoholics? And my sponsor said, what is it about you that maybe is taking the one thing from that man that makes him feel good about himself? Crap. And then she said, how important is it that your daughter have a hero for a father? Ooh, kind of important. And then she's like, you may be powerless, but you have influence. And the way you treat him will affect your daughter's relationship with him. Ugh. That was a bitter pill, but it helped me so much. And I began to treat him with dignity and respect, whether he deserved it or not, because it was good for me. Turns out, you have a choice. Be bitter or be better. And I want to be better. Regardless of if anyone around me gets better, I want to choose that high road. I have chosen to love the people in my family, even my father, even my mother, well, especially them, right? Because those are the people that are in my life, divinely designed to make me better. So I'm getting to love them in ways that I didn't know was possible because of the program. And we have this great adapter tool called detachment. <laughs> detachment is the adapter that allows me to be in relationship with people I couldn't normally be in relationship with. Anyway, so I'm being kind to my ex-husband, and I also ended up going back to church, which um, you know I did only because I was like, you know what, Al-Anon has taught me to take what I like and leave the rest. And after working the steps and defining and understanding my relationship with my higher power, and by the way, the church was on my resentment list, I identified there's a difference between God and the people who follow God. And I don't necessarily like or trust the people that follow God, but I, I can go directly to the source. And so I get as much as I can wherever I can, and I take what I like and leave the rest. And I just, so I started going back to church. And uh, I remember one day my daughter said, Mom, Dad wants to go to church with us. It's an answer to prayer. I was not praying that. <laughs> and, uh, so he started coming to church with us. So, of course, I started sleeping with him. What? <laughs> restoration celebration and we, we believe we want to believe the problem has gone away and uh, I ended up getting pregnant with my son at that time on purpose I didn't even know that that was a little hole in my heart that needed to be filled you know but planning his that pregnancy was such a gift and uh, my son was born so when I had a uh, 14 year old daughter and a seven month old son my life blew up again and, um, and what I can share with you is that the situation was not so different as the first time, except I was different. And I know that sometimes uh, you don't know if the program is working until something like a crisis happens. And it's like, oh my gosh, I have changed. And there was something in me that didn't want to make it worse. And, you know, my mom used to say, you see everything black, right? You make everything worse. And later when I worked a fourth step with my sponsor, she said that, can, that character defect will be turned into an asset. And you know it's true? I can make anything better. 
So instead of making things worse, like you give me just a little bit to be grateful for and I will blow it up. <laughs> so I blow up the good today instead of blowing up the bad. And when all that crap was happening, I didn't want to make it worse. So my commitment was, my sponsor said at the time, your two number one Al-Anon commitments are named Carissa and Luke. Nice. Your kids need to feel safe. They deserve to have one healthy parent. And, you know, I practiced, uh, my sponsor called it emotional prudence. Oh. <laughs> Sounds terrible. It's even hard to say it. Um, I'm not prudent. But anyway, emotional prudence is not everybody needs to know every detail. I don't have to embarrass my kids by running out. I don't have to tell you all the dirty little messy details of what happened. It is enough for me to say I have been affected by alcoholism and my life went sideways. That's it. And as a result of that, I'm able to come in and focus on recovery and practice emotional prudence. I am completely honest with a sponsor, but at that time, I, I didn't share all the details with everyone around us because, you know, we were in the program and everybody knew everybody and they take sides and all of that stuff. Anyway, I went through my second divorce and again, I began walking down a road I never wanted to be on. However, I've learned here, I can be the woman I've always wanted to be. And so... Um, I remember I would cry or whatever and go to my sponsor and just say, I didn't want to be a single mom of a teenager and a baby. Um, I remember I would be buying maxi pads and tampons and diapers. And I'm like, these are for my kids. Um, and, you know, it was, it was really tough. And um, my sponsor would say, you know, thank God for your loneliness. It means that you're not supposed to be alone. Some people are okay with being alone, but if the loneliness is killing you, it's because your body, soul, and spirit is saying, this is not how God intended it to be, which means it's going to get better. It's going to change. So be grateful for your loneliness. It means that something good is coming. And the second thing I did was I prayed for the other lonely women, especially the other lonely single moms. And that just became part of my nightly routine. Um, I did the single mom thing really well. I did it for 10 years. I was single and celibate and deliberately intentional with my kids. At that time, my daughter developed depression. I learned that depression is very similar to alcoholism and a result of it. And I was just as powerless over my daughter's depression as I ever was of her dad's drinking. And I am a natural cheerleader. I have the gift of affirmation. I like to see joy, bring joy to others. I can cheer pretty much anybody up except my kid. And I felt like I was kryptonite to her and I could not get her out of bed. I couldn't get her to want to live. And it was very, very painful. Um, after my daughter turned 20, um, she, she left home. She went to college. She went to San Francisco State. In fact, um, you know, I remember I told you college isn't for everyone. It's clearly not for her. But um, she dropped out a semester before she would have graduated. And I was devastated because college was something I wanted for her so badly. Today I know that her life is her own and that she, God loves her way more than I ever could love her. God doesn't have grandchildren. She belongs to God and that is her journey. And what I think she should be doing is none of her, like she shouldn't know what's in my thoughts. Uh, that's for me. I am so grateful um, uh, for detachment. I learned to like look at my daughter, like, you know, she's fully grown. She's full on adulting. And, um, but I had this guilt because of the roller coaster I put her under. Not even what, her dad did to her, but what I did. And, um, I remember, uh, there's a great book that we have in Al-Anon. It's called, um, uh, transforming our losses. It's our Al-Anon grief book. There's something else. So Some, opening our hearts, transforming our losses. Anyway, there's a section, you know, we talk a lot about grieving our childhood and all that. <clears throat> this section is about grieving the childhood you couldn't give your kids. And it hit me so hard, and I realized, oh, my gosh, I haven't forgiven myself. I'm still carrying this load, again, taking responsibility for what's not mine, and as a result of that, not taking responsibility for what is mine. And um, I carried that load for a long time, just feeling tremendous guilt because of what had happened. And she knew, 
where my buttons were. <laughs> and she pushed those buttons and I'd run to save her and run to help her. Today I know that my kind of love is actually not helping, it's hurting, especially someone who's trying to grow up. And, um, you know, I, I'm like, ugh, like <clears throat> just so like, oh, I gotta be up in your business. And um, anyway, detachment taught me to like watch her as if I'm watching a movie, right? And you don't yell at the movie. Well, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I do. You know, tell you, watch out! Like, um, it's useless to do that, right? So I imagine like I've got my popcorn and I'm just watching the Carissa show. And you know, the more I keep my mouth shut, shut the more she trusts me and will share things. Sometimes I don't want to hear that. <laughs> But I've learned to really let go and let God and trust that he has a purpose and a plan for her life just as he does mine. And I'm not responsible for her happiness or her security, but it was years in the making. Um, the, when I went through my second divorce with the same man, um, I remember someone shared with me, you know, put your heart in a cast. Like if you broke your foot, you wouldn't go run a marathon. So put your heart in a cast and trust that God's going to open it back up again. And I did. I had my heart in the cast. And I don't know if you've ever been around a cast that's been on too long, but it starts to stink. And um, I probably, like like everything else, I stay a little too long. Um, and uh, I persevere. Um, letting go is not in my nature. But anyway... I went to this Al-Anon retreat, and the thing about retreats is they use sleep deprivation. <laughs> it's like your walls come down, right? And uh, I remember I just had like this spiritual awakening, and it was like, I need to do a third step on like my love life, like this idea of like loving again. And I turned my will and my care of God, but because I realized like taking my eyes off of her was actually the best thing for her. And it was such a like epiphany because I had been like waiting for her to be happy before I could be happy. And for me, it felt like I literally turned my back on my daughter. It really did. But I was like, you know, it's time for me to start pursuing my own life. And, um, you know, I fell in love with a woman which is not the plot twist of my story. The plot twist is that I fell in love with an Al-Anon. That's the plot twist. That's what's so crazy. And we met at an Al-Anon retreat, and, um, you know, this idea that I could be worthy of someone who doesn't need me was mind-blowing. And I began to pursue this relationship with Crystal, and my kids were not happy about it. Not just because she was a woman, but because I had never been in a relationship other than their dad. And um, I remember my daughter was like, gosh, I live in San Francisco. You'd think I'd be so woke. And, you know, I have all these gay friends, but not my mom. And um, and she said, you know, why would you want to give us a more complicated life? Like, it's already been so painful. And I, it was almost like God in recovery was speaking through me, you know. And she said, you know, you're putting her before me. And I said, you know what? I'm putting me before you. And it just like came out of my mouth. I didn't even do that on purpose. I didn't even know I was doing that. But I was putting my program first. I was putting my happiness first. I was saying, it is okay for me to walk down this path, whether or not she's coming with me. Because, you know, she's mid-20s. And um, it was really hard. It felt like I was trying. And what one of the things we don't talk about is the reaction that we get when we start to put boundaries or do the right thing. And not everybody's happy about our changes. Uh, not everybody is clapping when you're getting better and healthier. And she certainly wasn't. And it was a journey. Um, and I would say, you know, it's been rocky. And she's much, she's doing better because, you know, here's the thing. Her measure of happiness and my measure of happiness are different. And so I, I try to love her no matter what, without expectations, without boundaries. I actually learned about a lot about loving my daughter from listening to you guys. And um, I practiced a program with her. My son is now, he's 16 and a half, and uh, you know, he's having a much better childhood than she ever had. And I remember saying to her, you know, I'm not gonna F him up just to make it fair. And you know, I'm so sorry. Um, but you know, when we know better, we do better.
dinner. And, um, you know, we're, we're living yeah, in second. Phoenix now. And, um, you know, it's funny because when, after the second divorce, I started praying for my kid's future stepmom. Because I just, you know, my uh, husband is a womanizer. And I just knew there was going to be another woman in their life influencing my kids and <gasps> spending time with my kids. And I was just like, ah. So I've learned to pray, right? And so I pray, I'm praying for the stranger, I'm praying for the stepmother. It turns out to be my wife. <laughs> my kid's stepmother is my wife. Like I've been praying for her this whole time. Who knew? For like more than 10 years. Um, my son and my wife love each other. They, uh, you know, they share clothes. <laughs> Like this is embarrassing. Like they totally and and my ex husband loves my wife. Like I never, I remember thinking, how is this gonna work? Because I have this really obsessive possessive ex husband. Like how is this gonna work, God? How are how you know? And you know, I I have all my plans, and then God has this wild alternative route. You know, this adventure that I would have never ever thought of. And um, only because I made a decision, like I was like, okay, I will trust you. Even with my love life, I will trust you. I would choose adventure over security, right? You know, people talk about struggling with the idea of whether or not God loves them. And I, I never had that struggle. I don't know why, but I, I know I'm lovable. Maybe that's it. But, um, and I know God loves me. I'm pretty sure I'm a magnet on his refrigerator. Like, I might be a favorite. I'm super lucky. And I just, I've always known that God loves me. Here's my issue. I don't believe he's going to take care of me. I think that I'm supposed to do that. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, no one, no one has my back. And I got to, I got to go this. And, you know, that's being dismantled in my relationship. You know, I have a very capable wife who is willing and able to help me. And yet here I am one more time, you know, no, thank you. I don't need help. I don't want to need help. I don't want to be vulnerable. And, you know, I'm being called to partnership that is way out of my comfort zone, but I'm willing. I, I've got this much willingness, right, to, to do it different, to do it better. Anyway, so we have this this grand life. My, my daughter, um, a little over a year ago, called me and said, um, are you sitting down? And I'm like, well, I'm driving. And um, <laughs> she's like, well, I need to tell you something. And I was like, oh. And she's like, I'm getting married, and I don't want you to come. Oh. And uh, in that moment, I knew what it meant to be, like, disappointed and proud at the same time, right? And Al-Anon has taught me that things are not black and white, that I can live in the tension of two feelings at once, and I can still choose the road of light. And immediately, without even hesitating, I was like, I'm so happy for you. I love you, whatever it means. Like, I'm so glad because of her journey, the fact that she would trust someone to get married who she loves. And I will tell you, God is so cute. Um, my son-in-law uh, is Hispanic and he loved, he, he lost his mother when he was young. And so he loves me. <laughs> he adores me. And he's like, have you called your mom? Can we call your mom? Let's call your mom. And I, like, oh. <laughs> I just love that boy. Anyway, um, you know, I, uh, oh, I forgot, forgot to tell you. So, so she tells me she's getting married. She doesn't want me to come. And I said, listen, you were in three of my weddings. Of course you don't want a wedding. You know, like, and that's the truth. She was in three of my weddings. Like if you had a punch card, you get a free yogurt, you know, like, of course she doesn't want a wedding, right? She went to, she went to Vegas. Elvis married her. It was, yeah. And it was on her terms. And, you know, they saw us a couple days later, you know, which was a treat. And, um, it was, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, again, Betty, getting back to expectations. I think things need to be a certain way. I don't know. I have no idea. I get to celebrate that my daughter has triumphed and she's found love and she's chosen to be in love, even though everything that she's been through. And we are all just like, the journey continues, right? Like, you know, I don't know what the next chapter will be, but I have um, a zeal for life because I feel like I have all that I need, right? I have a program for living, a design for how to handle whatever comes. And I welcome the twists. 
I welcome the adventure. I say, you know what? With God, I'll take the leap of faith. And I don't have to have everything in place secure for me to feel stable on the inside. Serenity, stability, happiness, those are my responsibility. And it's an inside job. Everything around me can be chaotic and I can be okay um, just for today, right? So here I am in Phoenix, um, you know, starting this new life, this new adventure. We actually got married on leap day right before the pandemic. So, so um, the, th the last thing I'll share with you is that my entire family came to my wedding, including my pastor father. And um, my dad is no longer drinking. He's not sober in AA, but again, it doesn't matter what it looks like, right? And I am able to have a relationship with every single person in my family. Uh, four out of the five kids went to Alateen. We all went to SCAC. Um, and I, for some reason, I'm the only one who still goes to meetings. That doesn't mean I'm better than them. doesn't mean that I'm sicker either, right? It just is. So I don't have to place judgment on every detail anymore. Not everything has meaning. It's just I, I happen to be the Al-Anon member in the family. That's okay. Um, my daughter chooses not to go to Al-Anon yet. I love the yet. Um, although she speaks the vernacular. So everywhere she goes, people are like, do you know Bill Wilson? Because um, like, she talks program without, you know, she's fluent in recovery. And, um, you know, it's a mat program of attraction. It's a program of attraction. Anyways, um, I am so grateful for the restored relationships that I have in my family. I'm also grateful for the new openness I have. We were talking at the table. We went on this wonderful hike yesterday. And I, I believe I'm getting younger. Like, I'm lighter. I'm not as serious. I'm not as bent on things have to be a certain way. Um, my identity is not in being the good girl. It's just being Sarah. And I don't know what that means for today, but I'm, I'm here and I'm present and I'm grateful to be with all of you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.